Hello and welcome to this instructional video on how to conduct some basic diagnostics on Endura AZ20 and AZ30 combustion gas oxygen analyzers from ABB. When we have a malfunctioning probe, the following diagnostic checks can help us to identify whether any specific component within the probe is malfunctioning. Most of these checks are detailed in our maintenance guide and you will find a link to this document in the video description below. Before we start, it is worth reminding ourselves of the main working components of an AZ20 or AZ30 probe which we will be testing today. Every probe contains a zirconia cell which provides a millivolt output which varies according to the oxygen imbalance between the application gas and the outside air. Zirconia needs to be at a high temperature to work, so we also have a heater and a thermocouple which together maintain the cell temperature at 700 degrees C. We also have a filter on the end which prevents soot and other dust from reaching our zirconia cell. These four principal components are what we would call the four working components of a zirconia probe and are what our diagnostic checks will be focusing on. Now I am going to demonstrate to you some of the quick checks we conduct to investigate component failure. These checks are run without power and when the probe is at room temperature. These checks are conducted by measuring the resistance across key components and comparing the values against lookup tables. Therefore we will need a multimeter, a screwdriver and a lookup table of the target values found in the maintenance guide. First things first, we need access, so unscrew and remove the end cap of the probe and unplug the 9-way terminal block. This is important as it isolates our probe electronics from the transmitter so that we get accurate resistance measurements. The first quick check I'm going to measure is the heater resistance value between the brown and blue terminals and compare our reading to the table in the maintenance guide. We then proceed to the second quick check where we measure the thermocouple resistance across the green and white coloured leads and compare it to our expected values. It is also worth checking that the thermocouple and electrode assembly is isolated from the probe body earth by looking for a high resistance value between the green or white terminals and the probe body. We then proceed to the third quick check where we measure the resistance between the red cell plus terminal and the probe body earth. You should see a value way over 20 kilo ohms. If you see a much lower value, check for short circuits to earth in the probe's internal wiring. The final quick check is to measure the ACJC or PT1000, resistance between the purple and grey coloured leads and compare it to the table in the maintenance guide. Remember, if you perform any corrective actions as a result of these tests, such as replacing a cell or thermocouple, you must recalibrate the probe once fully assembled and installed. These checks are all run while the probe is at process temperature and when the power is on. The probe must be thermally stable to run these tests, so the probe has to be left on for at least two hours before starting them. If the cell temperature is at 700 degrees C and the heater output is remaining fairly steady, you should be okay. Because these tests are run with a live system with mains electricity present, these checks should only be carried out by suitably competent personnel. To conduct these functional tests, you will need the following items as shown on the screen. First, measure and record the ambient temperature at the transmitter thermocouple terminals in the probe head. Then measure the voltage across the same terminals and compare it with the table in the maintenance guide. This tells us if we are getting the expected millivolts from our thermocouple based on the known temperature differential. If the value is incorrect, then the recommendation is to replace the cell and or thermocouple assembly. In this test, we are going to directly measure the cell millivolt output on known test gases using a multimeter. 
First, we must disconnect the red and black wires from the 9-way terminal block. Then, we apply 1% test gas to TG1 and leave it for a few minutes to settle. Similar to calibration, if you don't have restrictors, control the flow to get around 3.2 litres per minute. If your probe has autocal, we must manually open the test gas valve in the transmitter menu, as shown here. Finally, we measure the millivolts across the red and black cell terminals and cross-check our results with a the theoretical cell value in the maintenance guide. A typical output for 1% gas is around 65 millivolts, which is what I got from my cell. You can also repeat the test with compressed air, where you are looking for a millivolt reading somewhere around plus or minus 2 millivolts. If your reading is more than 5 millivolts away from the theoretical value, then the cell may need to be replaced. If the reading is good, then it is highly likely that the cell, heater and thermocouple are all working well. This final check, which is not shown in the maintenance guide, is to check for blockages in the filter. Even upon visual inspection, it can sometimes be difficult to determine the blockage status of the filter. To perform this test, we will use the effect of pressure to alter the zirconia measurement. By passing compressed air above the normal flow rate through the test gas line, we can pressurise the measurement side of the cell behind the filter. If the filter is blocked, the pressure will increase behind the filter by a greater amount, thereby increasing the oxygen content on the measurement side, resulting in a higher reading from our probe. If the filter is not blocked, we will still see a light increase from the compressed air, but as the compressed air can escape from the filter, the pressure effect will be much less. How you apply the compressed air will depend on your probe. If your probe has no restrictors, then attach the compressed air line to TG1. If you have no restrictors but you have the integral autocal system, then apply the compressed air to TG1 as before, but you will also need to manually open the internal TG1 valve in the menu shown in the video here. Whether you have the autocal system or not, if your probe has test gas restrictors, you will need to bypass these to perform the test. We do this by disconnecting the plastic tube and applying the air directly to the metal test gas tube in the probe. You can find out if your probe has restrictors here. Be careful with the plastic tube, it can be tricky to pull off, so be careful not to tear it. If you do, you must replace the tube to avoid leaks. There are live wires present too, so be careful around these as well. We do not need a lot of air to conduct our test. For my bench test, I turned my supply regulator down to half a bar, which gave me ample air supply for this demonstration. When you are ready to start the test, turn on the compressed air supply and observe the O2 percentage reading on the transmitter screen. Here you can see the results I got using an old filter which was very badly blocked versus a new clean filter. As you can see, the blocked filter increased a lot more and held this high reading even after I turned off the compressed air supply, because there is nowhere for the air to go. Depending on the reading that you see, you may need to make a judgement call. Again, remember that if you perform any corrective actions as a result of any of these tests, you must recalibrate the probe once fully assembled and installed. Thank you for watching this instructional video from ABB.